one thing I've studied um, in the last couple of years is the effect of Walmart on pretty much anything. So a lot of people criticize Walmart for a variety of reasons, or a lot of people who love Walmart for a variety of reasons. And so the question that I and a couple of co-authors are asking is, well, if, if we're going to have an intelligent discussion about Walmart, then what needs to be true? How do we need to go about how do we need to go about having that discussion? What are the standards of evidence that we need to apply? And then finally, um, so one this one thing I'll, I'll talk about a little bit with y'all is so what does this mean for you as perspective as perspective lawyers? Um, some of you might be familiar with the Dukes versus Walmart case, which is the largest class action lawsuit in history, alleging that Walmart is engaging in illegal and unethical and unsavory discrimination, um, and has been, against women. So we'll talk about how that squares with other objections that Walmart is sort of blindly and morbidly obsessed with profit. Um, okay, some of you might notice uh, there, there's a bit of an internal inconsistency there. And then also, also a, question, a question we might ask is, given... Given, corp given not corporate social responsibility, but corporate responsibility to shareholders and investors, would we really need something like the National Labor Relations Board? Do we really need, some, do we really need the body of labor law that we have today? I'm not a lawyer, so I can't, uh, uh, so I can't say yes, and no, yes or no. I am an economist, however, and I can say here's how an economist might want to think about some of these issues. <coughs> okay, so um, let's run down basically sort of a tick list of why people hate Walmart. So one, jobs. So Walmart comes in, Walmart destroys jobs. They run uh, small businesses out of business, uh, they pay low wages, and they're just generally a terrible corporate citizen. Um, the current standard of empirical evidence suggests, however, that on net, Walmart is, a, uh, Walmart is actually a creator of employment. So every Walmart is associated with an increase of approximately 50 jobs in the retail sector, and a reduction of 20 or 30 jobs in a little bit farther up the supply chain. So on net, Walmart creates some, every new Walmart creates something to the effect of 20 or 30 jobs, and then economizes on resources of the supply chain by reducing the amount of labor needed to move goods from, say, the port of Long Beach to, oh, let's say, uh, Gardendale, Alabama, where, uh, which is where my, 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 uh, my lovely wife is from, and, uh, just south of where my where my family lives. Okay, so jobs. Well, people hate people hate Walmart because uh, they allegedly destroy jobs. It turns out that's not really the case. Walmart's old motto was always low prices. Okay, and this is this is where the really big effect of Walmart comes in. Ephraim uh, Ephraim Leitag and Jerry Hausman, a couple of economists who wrote a few papers for the National Bureau of Economic Research a few years ago estimated that the impact of Walmart on prices is so large that we're actually overstating the rate of inflation. Our failure to account for the effect of Walmart, okay, not just Walmart, but the effect of big box retail, Walmart, Sam's Club, Costco, Target, Kmart, etc. Since the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the government is not, um, excuse me, the Commerce Department is not adequately accounting for their impact on retail and distribution channels, we're actually overstating, we're actually overstating the rate of inflation. Um, and thus, inflation is actually lower than it would be if, according to them, we properly, we properly accounted for, uh, for the Walmart effect. Um, of course, believe the price. Well, people criticize Walmart because, okay, so they might create jobs, but one of the crappy jobs, you know, the really bad jobs, earning seven bucks an hour stocking shelves, third shift. Um, and there's actually some merit to this. Uh, there's one paper that came out several years ago arguing that counties in which Walmart has a very strong presence have uh, had either increases in poverty or slower decreases in the poverty rate um, than, other, uh, than other counties where Walmart did not do business. That's something that I and, I and my co-authors want to kind of explore again, because uh, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later. I think we might actually have better data. But since we haven't actually run any estimates, we can, we can look at, this, we can look at, the, at these uh, at these poverty statistics and think that maybe this paper probably holds some water. Nonetheless, though, as Hausman and LiveTag, the guys who did the price studies, have argued, the benefits accrue disproportionately to the poor. So Walmart comes in, or Walmart expands, and when I say Walmart, a lot of times I'm, I'm using that as a proxy for big box retail in general. So big box retail, Walmart, Target, Kmart, etc., moves in, lowers prices, and primarily the prices that they lower 
or the, the, the major spillovers on prices, are going to be for goods that are consumed by the poor. Okay, so the disproportionate impact of Walmart is on, uh, or the disproportionate benefit of Walmart is for the very, is for the very, very poor. And we'll see that with some of the research that I and co-authors have been doing. Well, okay, well, well what about, what about suppliers? So the title of, of, of the talk is taken from the title of Charles Fishman's book, The Walmart Effect. And he has this, this very vivid story about how Walmart squeezed the Vlasic Pickle Company. Okay? And so, so, so if you, for people who sell pickles, I don't, but according, according, to, the, uh, according to, to the discussion of the industrial organization of pickles in Fishman's book, the very, very high margins are on sliced pickles. So like sli- so hamburger, you know, the, the ones that you put on burgers and things like that. Very, very low margins on whole pickles. And uh, if, I, if I remember this correctly, um, Vlasic was selling, I believe it was, a, it was either a one-gallon jar or a three-gallon jar. I can't remember which. But a very, very large jar of whole pickles for $2.97, obviously. And so Walmart demanded that they continue selling these gigantic jars of pickles to them. The story goes that this... Um, hurt Vlasic considerably because they could because they had to do, devote so many resources to producing these giant jars of pickles as opposed to the higher margin, smaller jars of pickles, and thus Walmart Walmart squeezes suppliers and is therefore bad for the American economy, bad for small business, etc. Um, once again, I'm not entirely sure that's true uh, because there's a paper in I believe it was the Journal of Retailing sometime within the, within the last several years, it's argued that, yeah, when you first start dealing with Walmart, that's a bad deal because they're going to squeeze your profit margins, and for a couple of years, you're not going to make nearly as much money as you would if you were selling to mom and pop. However, access to Walmart's supply chain is, over the long run, a very good deal for your company. So Walmart might reduce short-run profitability for some suppliers, but then increase long-run profitability because if you have access to Walmart's supply chain, then you literally then you literally have access to a global market, as opposed to you know making arts and crafts and selling them uh, at the craft fair on the weekend. We'll say to, to take a very extreme example, um, you can now produce you can now mass produce your arts and crafts and sell them to anybody pretty much anywhere, and earn massive profits by so doing. Well, what about what about mom and pop? Okay. Big criticism of Walmart is, is they come in, they destroy little mom and pop, where uh, little mom and pop stores. Uh, I believe that the movie uh, Walmart High Cost of Low Price, uh, which a friend of mine watched and then told me about, um, which honestly I've not I've, I've not seen, but I've, I've heard that the story is basically Walmart comes in, drives a hardware store out of business, and so the story is in part about. Uh, the trials and travails of this hardware store. And it's true. If you're in a business that competes with Walmart and Walmart comes to town, you're dead. You know, just you are not going to be you are not going to be able to compete with Walmart on ketchup. You're not going to be able to compete with Walmart on pickles. You're not going to be able to compete with Walmart on no name hammers. Okay? So trying so so trying to compete with Walmart in areas where Walmart has a comparative advantage is a recipe for disaster if you're if you're a small business person. However um, Russ Sobel and Andrea Dean at West Virginia University have beaten the data to death and have shown that there's basically no, no impact of Walmart on small business employment, small business profitability, or small business prevalence in areas where Walmart does business. Because, yeah, it's true that mom and pop's grocery is living on borrowed time as soon as the Walmart Supercenter opens up. However, this creates demand for all sorts of other goods, law services, ice cream parlors, um, high-end or re- re- relatively high-end restaurants, relatively high-end clothing. Um, I believe it's still one of the uh, STIHL company that makes like chainsaws and leaf blowers and things like that. They have an advertisement in the Wall Street Journal that says you can't get our products at Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, Target, etc., because they're of such high quality that you want to sell them through small through smaller outlets. Okay, so. As Walmart comes in, yeah, they creatively destroy mom and pop's grocery store, but that opens the door for Aunt Dan and Uncle Dot's ice cream parlor to open up down the street. So, so the net effect of, of Walmart on small business is not uh, quite what it's played out in the media. 
let's talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done, or some of the work that I and my co-authors have done. We've got this, this thesis that Walmart destroys communities. Okay, so people might say, well, Walmart, okay, they don't really, um, they don't affect jobs, they lower prices, all this other stuff, but you know, Walmart is part of this, uh, this sort of capitalist expansion that makes us more, um, more focused on material goods and less focused on you know, the finer things in life, relationships with our family, relationships with our friends, church, uh, you know, being members of social organizations, voting, things like that. Well, it turns out, <coughs> and there's a, there's a paper actually about one of the people who, vote, who wrote the poverty paper originally, uh, he and some other co-authors argued that Walmart destroys social capital. Okay, so social capital consists of networks, networks of individual relationships, the networks that we use to get things done. It's both an input into production in that you can use networks to get a job. I presume that you know pretty much everybody will use social networks to somehow find gainful employment after law school. Um, it's also a consumption good in that you know you just enjoy spending time with your family and things like that. Well. We use what, what again, I, uh, what we think is a better data set. For those of you who have read uh, Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, all of his data on social capital are available on his website. And we find that there's not, we can't identify an effect, a systematic effect of Walmart on social capital. So it looks like this, this thesis that Walmart destroys social capital is also um, <coughs> lacking in empirical support. Another couple of papers we've written. If you look at polemics on Walmart, <clears throat> the company's been criticized from both the left wing and the right wing for how they affect values, or for at least, a, for at least their stance on values. Okay, so John Dicker wrote, uh, wrote this book called The United States of Walmart several years ago. It has a really entertaining little subsection entitled Cosmo Gets a Burka. Okay, so for those of you who are, who are fans of Nirvana, fans of Sheryl Crow, fans of Eminem, you're not going to find their music at Walmart. If you read Stuff, if you read Maxim, if you read For Him, you're not going to find that at Walmart. If you read Cosmo, then you're probably going to find that you know the, the cover of Cosmo, the cover of Glamour, the cover of the, you know, the various things you can see right next to the, next to the, checkout, the <laughs> checkout stand, those are going to be obscured because Walmart shoppers have said, you know, I don't want my child reading. You, know, you see the headlines on Cosmo and things like that, and not something that's to be repeated in mixed company. Um, <clears throat> So John Dicker says that basically what Walmart is doing is they're serving as a conservative cultural gatekeeper trying to voice their right-wing values on the rest of the country. Conversely, um, people from the extreme right, so uh, a lot of religious groups, boycotted Walmart or announced a boycott of Walmart several years ago when they um, joined the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. Okay? So it's argued that, Walmart, that from that respect, Walmart is undermining Mom, America, God, Apple Pie, etc., by joining the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. From the left, wall, from the left, people are arguing that Walmart is trying to censor uh, media that we don't want to uh, uh, media that they that they don't want people to have access to. So we look at again using Putnam's data, we look at the relationship between Walmart and individual values, and find that now there's not really a relationship between Walmart and how often you go to the bar, how often you go to church, um, whether you consider yourself liberal, liberal or conservative whether you consider yourself old fashioned or not. So that so so that so that strikes me as a as, as a as a dry well in terms of things that people are trying to pump to criticize Walmart. One thing one uh, some of the things that we're that we're interested in as sort of Walmart researchers is the income effect for Walmart. So Walmart comes in, they lower prices, and this this has kind of given them a new motto, which is save more, live better. So basically, Walmart's new motto is about the income effect from, uh, from Walmart entry. If you don't remember income and substitution effects from introductory econ, I gave an exam on this to my Econ 101 students yesterday, and it's all, it's, it, it, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a mess. But nonetheless, what it suggests is that when, when prices change, one thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to have additional purchasing power. So you can afford bigger bundles of stuff. Okay, and among those bigger bundles of stuff would be different leisure activities. So we find that, well, uh, in places where Walmart does business, consistent with the thesis that Walmart is allowing people to save more and live better, people go to the opera more often. They uh, play team sports with equipment that Walmart makes cheaper a little bit more often, and they substitute away from things that, Wal that Walmart shouldn't necessarily affect. 
Similarly, in asking whether Walmart's policy of everyday low prices or always low prices allows people to save more, live better, um, in a recent paper, we've explored the relationship between Walmart and obesity, or between Walmart and uh, Walmart and body weight. Because, again, sort of going into the project, we thought, well, Walmart goes in, um, prices go down, and, well, obviously they should reduce the price of food. Lower-priced food means people eat more, therefore people gain weight. So we should expect to see Walmart potentially have a positive effect on people's weight. And what we, what we find, again, is actually the opposite. So it appears, it appears that Walmart decreases human weight or decreases the probability that people are, weight, uh, that, that people are, are obese, but the effect is trivially small. So, so, what, so one criticism of Walmart that it might encourage unhealthy eating also doesn't really hold, uh, doesn't really hold a, a whole lot of water empirically. We do find some evidence, though, that, uh, that Walmart reduces weight the channel through which this occurs is it appears that, wall, that increased Walmart penetration um, induces people to consume higher quantities of fruits and vegetables and lower, uh, lower quantities of fats. So it improves people's diets, again, primarily through, uh, through, what, through what we think is an income effect. Walmart allows people to save more money. And so instead of eating you know, frozen, uh, frozen TV dinners that are loaded with preservatives and fats and all sorts of other things, um, they can they can take that they can take their savings and go down to Whole Foods Market Whole Foods Market and buy um, peanut butter panda puffs or or, 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 some, or something something to that effect. All right. One thing that we think is especially interesting about the Walmart effect is in a. A book that was released recently, Richard Vedder and Wendell Cox report an estimate of what they call the social saving attributable to Walmart. And this is a very dirty, very back-of-the-envelope calculation. I keep telling people, um, students who are looking for a dissertation topic in economics, that, that refining this estimate would, would, be, would be an excellent project. They estimate that the social saving from Walmart is approximately 5% of U.S. GDP. So roughly two years of economic growth attributable solely to the existence of Walmart. And so if we think back, and so, so that, that's it's not really much, but when I think back to, what, to the way that my life was two years ago, you know, our family only had one car. I didn't own an iPod. You know, I, I kind of like having, having, all, having all of this stuff, so this additional two years' worth of economic growth is pretty nice to have. For comparison's purposes, this is roughly the same impact on American output that the railroads exerted in the 19th century. So no Walmart or no big box retail would be basically the same thing as having had no railroads in the 19th century for purposes of economic growth. And that, I believe, is substantial. So um, one, thing, one thing that I want to that I want to sort of sort of focus on that would make that make this relevant for you all as prospective uh, as prospective lawyers is how do we draw inferences about the Walmart effect? How do, we, how do we decide what the evidence actually says beyond just running regressions, beyond just using statistical techniques, and beyond just, and beyond just someone saying, well, uh, they moved into Walmart and mom and pop's hardware closed down, therefore Walmart's bad. And then the second, the second question that I, that, that I want to ask in terms, of, in terms of application here is with respect to the Dukes versus Walmart case, how can, how can we determine whether discrimination is actually going on and whether that discrimination is actually legally actionable. So what we do here in, in, a, variety, in a variety of our papers and in, in all of the papers throughout, throughout the Walmart literature is finding a correlation between Walmart and something else is never sufficient to demonstrate that there's a causal relationship. So there are a handful of techniques we can use to uh, try to identify causal relationships with Walmart. Um, on one hand, you can try to control for everything else that might be uh, that, that it might explain it might explain the observed correlation. We do that in a lot of cases. In, in, in addition, you can use what are called instrumental variable techniques, in which you use something that is presumably correlated with Walmart, but not correlated with the observed effect. Try to use that to predict Walmart location, and then use that with a bunch of fancy fancy math to uh, try to try to arrive at an unbiased estimate of the, of the Walmart effect. So one thing, that, one thing that we use in some of our papers and that other people have used, so we're basically borrowing the idea from them, is distance from Bentonville, Arkansas, to predict Walmart location 
which in turn allows us to predict the Walmart effect on different variables. So if you look at, at Walmart's pattern of expansion, it tends to occur in more or less concentric circles around Pentonville. Okay, because, because their explicit development strategy was um, to, build, to build warehouses, uh, uh, to build their warehouse network close to company headquarters, and then build their stores within a reasonable drive of, of, of those warehouses. So that allows us, so, so, so that there are techniques out there that, that would allow us to find the effect of Walmart on whatever. Okay, so for purposes, for purposes of, um, uh, for purposes of arriving at evidence beyond just, you know, say, uh, you know, anecdotes and testimony, we can, we can use the best available data out there to, to estimate with some precision what these effects actually are. Now, the second question that I, that I wanted to ask was about, was about Dukes v. Walmart, which is the largest class action lawsuit um, ever certified in the United States. I believe uh, it's a class action of 1.6 million former Walmart employees against the Walmart Corporation, alleging a pattern of historical and systematic discrimination on the basis of gender, primarily. So women were um, discriminated against, bumped into lower-paying, lower-productivity occupations, at least according to the plaintiffs in, Duke's, uh, uh, in the Dukes v. Walmart case. So the question I want to ask is, well, how would we identify, one, how would we know exactly how that's true? And two, if it is true, how will, we, how, how will we know whether it's legally actionable? Okay, so I'm not going so to talk about the specific letter of the law in this case. I'm going to speak, speak probably a little bit more broadly. But uh, in an essay that was written by one of the plaintiff's attorneys in the case, he said, you know, they interviewed hundreds of people to find stories about, to, to identify this pattern of discrimination at Walmart. But that might be a little bit problematic, especially, especially in a class action with, with 1.6 million plaintiffs, because... You know, 0.1% of 1.6 million is still a lot of people. Okay, so even if in 0.1% of cases people were mistreated at Walmart, via you know, purely randomly, you're going to find you're going to find a lot of horror stories in a company that in a company that's that large. So finding so finding a collection of horror stories is not sufficient to demonstrate that there's a uh, uh, there's a systematic pattern of discrimination. Okay, so I think that, that appealing to some of the statistical techniques that we're using in some of and when I say we, I mean not just me and my co-authors who are writing these papers, but I mean all the people who are contributing to this Walmart literature. Um, I think we need, we need to take a slightly different tack if we're going to try to demonstrate that people are being paid less than what they're worth at Walmart or if they're being shunted into lower productivity occupations solely because of their gender. Another thing that we, that we need to reconcile is there, there's a dual criticism of Walmart that is internally inconsistent. One... Walmart discriminates against women on the basis of gender. So they're so blinded by their old boy network. They're so blinded by their rural culture. They're so blinded by their taste for discrimination that they're willing to leave money on the table in order to indulge you know, their old boy values. At the same time, however, Walmart has been criticized for being morbidly obsessed with profit. So Walmart will do anything to increase, uh, to increase that number on the bottom line, and that's inconsistent with the idea that Walmart is somehow a vicious and malicious uh, discriminator. Even if they are, though, it's not really clear whether that is something, whether, 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 whether that's, that's something that, that should be a statutory matter or whether it's a question about Walmart's relationship with its shareholders. Because if you're a member of, the wall of Walmart's board of directors, if you're the CEO, your fiduciary, your fiduciary duty to your shareholders is to maximize the value of your stock. Now, if you're discriminating, then you're not fulfilling that fiduciary duty to your shareholders because that says you're willing to leave profits on the table in order to indulge some bizarre concept of the way that the world ought, the, the way that the world ought to operate. So in sort of a perfect neoclassical um, economic universe, people who discriminate and who leave profits on the table are going to get slapped around by the invisible hand and are, get, and are going to get competed out of the marketplace. Even if stuff like this persists over time, what we, should, what, we should, what we should expect is not necessarily that the government would have to step in and say, okay, Walmart, thou shalt not discriminate because discrimination is bad, but rather watchdogs who have, in some cases, billions of dollars riding on Walmart's profitability should be there to provide the constraints that ensure Walmart doesn't engage in this, in, in this kind of behavior. 
Okay, because again, Walmart's board of directors, Walmart's executives' fiduciary duty to shareholders is to maximize shareholder value. Discrimination is not consistent with that fiduciary duty. And thus, the question that we would have to ask is what would be the mechanisms that would be preventing Walmart um, from exercising their fiduciary duty to shareholders if we're going to maintain that somehow Walmart is engaged in this, in this type of, uh, of awful and nefarious discrimination. And that basically, I think, is how, how, we, would think about the, how we think about the Walmart effect um, using the basic tools of economics, which is, one, really trying to identify the marginal effect of Walmart on pretty much anything we're interested in, and then, two, using the internal logic of basic economics, of basic profit maximization, to determine what we would have to observe in the real world if, we're, if, if this hypothesis that Walmart discriminates against women is going to be true. Whether it's true or not, I'm not really certain. Um, haven't stu- I haven't, haven't studied that, but I think this is really the way that, we, that we're going to need to frame it. So I really appreciate you all having me in. Uh, I've had a great time here so far today, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you all might have about Walmart, about what I do. Um, and since you know, y'all are lawyers and I'm not, um, especially with respect to the Dukes v. Walmart case, I'm, I'm certainly interested in, in any in any feedback y'all might have there. Yeah? What, what's Walmart's uh, rate of return on equity or whatever you would want? What's their profit? How profitable are uh, they? See, Wal- Walmart's, Walmart's profit margins, I believe they return roughly market uh, market returns. I know their profit their profit margins on sales are very, very low, once say 3 or 4%. Um, I think their return on the equity is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%, but I, I would have to check that on, on Yahoo Finance. So, so this is a company that's growing exponentially and also right. fabulously profitable. Right, yes. So yeah, it's yeah. Not, uh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so Walmart, obviously, they, may, they earn all their profits on volume. Um, they're, they're actual, their margins are very, very low, very, very low, uh, but they're able, to turn, they're able to convert that into billions of dollars um, in profits every year. So if you, so if you look if you look at Walmart's profit margins, they actually don't perform that well relative to a lot of other smaller firms. But just to extend your point about Dukes, mm-hmm. there really isn't a, 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 a lavish margin they could play with and decide right. to sacrifice they kind of deliver. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So given so given that given that Walmart is given that Walmart does operate with such with such low margins. Um, and that all of the, that all of their volume is, or excuse me, that all of their uh, uh, their profit comes from turnover. That's going to be a real constraint uh, on them in terms in terms of being able to sacrifice profitability on certain margins in order to indulge a taste for discrimination. Uh, given that, uh, again, and they have they've, they've been criticized for having an, al- an almost morbid obsession with efficiency. Um, given that alleged morbid obsession with efficiency, that should weed out people sort of up and down the Walmart management hierarchy who are willing to sacrifice gains from improved productivity in order to uh, indulge a taste for discrimination. It's one, one thing that I haven't looked at yet, but where, where I think in terms of how Walmart intersects the law and economics literature or how Walmart would, it, would intersect the uh, uh, sort of the corporate governance literature, we need to look at how Walmart handles situations in which, and, and these, had, these happen all, all the time, um, in which say, managers wish to, uh, or say, in, in which managers don't promote people because of race, because of gender, because of, because of something like that. And I would expect that, even though it happens, that it's going to be, it's, it's going to be relatively rare, rare and it's going to be dealt with swiftly. But again, that's something I haven't, uh, I personally haven't looked into yet. Yeah? What, if, what do you think the, the life cycle of a, of, a, of a huge retailer like Walmart is? In other words, I mean, you know, 30 years ago, Kmart was sort of the big uh, uh, discount retailer. Before that, you know, something like, I don't know, A&P, right. you know, and, and it seems like that there's a there's almost a life cycle where they sort of, you know, <coughs> these firms get big, they sort of dominate, and then they get, you know, right. uh, uh, you know complacent or, or inefficient or whatever, and then, they, and then the market opens up for, for smaller, leaner uh, competitors. Where do you... First of all, do you think that there is a kind of life cycle like that? And, and if so, where is Walmart now in that life cycle? Do you think? That's that's a really interesting question, and there's a lot there. So uh, so so let so let me uh, 
But let me, let me answer that with a couple of points. One, sort of the, the history of retail in the United States. Two, uh, Walmart's quicker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's taking a couple hours. No, no, no. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> two, uh, some discussion of some of Walmart's competitors like Aldi, who are kind of the quicker, leaner, um, quicker, leaner companies. Uh, three, Don Boudreaux's sort of forward hypothesis about what Walmart will, will do. And then two, and then my, my hypothesis about what Walmart will be in, in 50 years. Okay, so one, history of, Amer- history of American retail. Um, mom and pop were kind of destroyed by A&P back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. And then whatever mom and pop survived A&P were crushed by Sears, uh, well, let's, let's see, Sears, Kmart, and other big discounters in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Kmart, as I understand it, committed a serious entrepreneurial error by focusing on sort of larger towns, whereas Walmart, uh, their, their original patterns of expansion were in very, very small towns um, where they're able to cluster a lot of they're able to cluster a lot of stores around their distribution network and enjoy cost cost savings from that. Um, as for whether there's they're, they're sort of a natural cycle, I don't really know, but I I, I agree with. Um, with Murray Rothbard's assessment of sort of the socialist calculation problem that tends to exacerbate itself as firms get larger, because you know a firm a firm is basically sort of a, a small a small scale non market enterprise, and as firms get larger and firms get larger and firms get larger, they have to make more and more decisions based on 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 sort of internally estimated prices that are not in fact going to be market prices. So that so that's going to that's going to reduce the efficiency of the firm. As it gets larger, and that, that, that gives me some comfort uh, in knowing that Walmart will not someday take over the world. Um, okay, I do think that uh, some of their le- some of their leaner and meaner competitors, I think, are already observing th- things that Walmart does very poorly. Um, I, I remember reading an article several years ago. It'll be interesting to see how this works out. Uh, Aldi, as I understand it, part of their articulated business strategy. And again, like I said, I'll, I'll need to I'll need to check on this because this is I'm going on memory from an article I read probably five years ago. Um, one thing that they looked for was to build in Walmart shadow. So so they go in and and and, and all all these is kind of an amazing company because they use primarily house brand products. Um, again, razor thin margins, but every Aldi, as I understand it, is 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 pretty much exactly alike. So 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 they, they have a very they have a very different business model. They also own Trader Joe's. Which uh, there's, actually, there's actually a Facebook group called Trader Joe's. Please come to Memphis. That, uh, that's, that's some, some, some of my, of my, my, my friends, my friends are part of. And, and Trader Joe's, Trader Joe's is sort of the Aldi of the uh, of the, the high end premium food market. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I, I think I think there, there are a lot a lot of companies that are looking to fill the gap where Walmart doesn't do so well. Um, my hypothesis, sort of tongue in cheek. Is that in 50 years Walmart is basically going to be like IBM today? They're going to be a consulting company, okay? Because they're, and that may not necessarily be true, but all of their major competencies are in supply chain, hmm? logistics, right? Yeah, logistics, supply chain management, and things like that. There is no force, there, there's been no entity on earth ever that is better than Walmart at getting some, getting something from point A to point B, um, pretty much anywhere in the world. I was about to say the, uh, the the only possible exception I can think of would be Federal Express, um, but but Walmart can Walmart can move large quantities of stuff, um, and so one thing one thing that they've been moving toward, particularly in terms of their international operations, is working with local firms uh, where they can combine their competencies in global supply chain management with local co- with local competencies um, in knowing the relevant markets in say like. So, you know, small towns in India, for example, where you know if you are uh, if you're an executive in Bentonville, Arkansas, your knowledge of market conditions in rural India, suffice it to say, are probably going to be uh, that's probably going to be going to be relatively limited. Um, so, I th- so I think I think that that's that's where that's the direction Walmart is probably going to move. It's going to be in moving large quantities of goods to areas where you have firms with a comparative advantage in exploiting local knowledge. Now, Don Boudreaux, I think, had a, had an interesting thought. I, I can't remember if he put this on his blog or if it was in a podcast, but he said he thinks that someday uh, when Walmart goes out of business, people are going to lament the passing of the, the same people who hate Walmart today are going to lament the passing of this this venerable American institution. And uh, I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see how uh, see how that goes. 
Yes. When I look at this list of Roman criminals, we're going to see you on the board, and I think about the low profit market. I think about what you said about the mom and pop being replaced uh, and you know, others along the uh, historical chain. Uh, we're going to stand by efficiency. You know, I always shudder with the welcome to modern America uh, fear that with the low profit market, the rent seeking might be the one to get Walmart out of the What do you think about that? That's actually. Uh, I'll, I'll digress for a second, because uh, I've, I've been asked to speak on the current financial crisis in a couple of different places, and uh, I've, t- I've, told, I've told people that, that in reading about that, I've, I've, been, I've been hit with almost two overwhelming urges. One, to take a shower, because it just, it just, well, it just, you just feel dirty getting into all this, and two, to read Atlas Shrugged again, and so that, that's, so that, so that, that, I'm, that I'm actually doing. Um, and I, I would hope that eventually, uh, eventually Walmart doesn't get Put out of business by by rent seeking. I think I think they've so on on, on one hand, um, I think they're they're astute enough to be able to continue operating even if they even if they're they end up being unionized. Um, that would be I think tragic, particularly for the poor. Um, but at the same time, though, I think Walmart has, has made sort of a deal with the devil in terms of their aggressive pursuit of local subsidies. It's in, in, in certain places. So, so it said that, you know, the, those, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So if, uh, um, since they've chosen to play that game, um, I, I really, I really hope it doesn't come back to, come back to haunt them. Somebody tried to quantify how important the subsidies have been. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, is that a big deal or a, yeah, or there's a, a big deal or a small? There, there's actually a, uh, um, an organization called Good Jobs First. That's one of the, it's part of the sort of anti Walmart pantheon that has a, uh, they have a position paper called Shopping for Subsidies where they try to estimate, they, 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 try, they try to estimate the, the amount of, the amount of, of government largesse that Walmart has enjoyed. Um, then there are a couple of different organizations that have, have argued that public health infrastructure subsidizes Walmart's business model as well. Um, I think those are, I, I, my personal belief is that those are fundamentally flawed because they, they try, it's not clear what, what the counterfactual is. There, it seems like they're assuming that, that if it weren't for Walmart, everybody would be earning twenty dollars an hour plus full health benefits. I'm not exactly sure that's the case. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, are, there are people who've tried to measure it. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I've always been struck by, I, I did some uh, did some writing on these anti big box ordinances about okay. a couple of years ago, and one of the things that's, that struck me about them is number one how um, incautious most of the people, most of the localities passing them were in the sense that they would be quite blatant about, you know, trying to keep out big big box stores generally. Walmart, you know, is singled out for a particular uh, score. But what, what I found interesting, uh, and I don't you know if you have an explanation for this, or maybe you've already talked about it, and I apologize for coming late, but um, Costco and Target and other big box stores, the Trader Joe's, um, even even Costco, which has a membership model not unlike Sam's, they don't seem to um, they don't seem to uh, uh, raise as many hackles. I mean, you don't see people protesting a Costco coming in. Is that just because you can get red wine and smoke salmon there, and as opposed to <laughs> having to they, yeah, see okay. poor people? Or is that, <laughs> is that yeah, yeah, there are a couple of a uh, couple of interesting hypotheses about that. Uh, so on one hand. Okay, so, so one, um, you've got, you've got the, the Walmart class action lawsuit. Um, you also have a, a class action gender discrimination lawsuit against Costco. And so if you go to the, if you go to the Walmart class action lawsuit website and the Costco class action lawsuit website, they've got, you know, they both have pictures of these women, and in both cases it's the exact same women. Okay, in both the Walmart, the, both the, on both the Walmart website and the Costco. Website, so 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 I, I, I found that somewhat entertaining. Is it the same law firm as well? I believe so, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay, but 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 Costco is interesting. Um, I've I've never actually been in a Costco, but I've, I've heard I've heard that the Costco business model, as, as I understand it, is um, to provide really good deals on high end merchandise, whereas the Sam's Club, Walmart. Business model is to provide really good deals on low-end merchandise. Um, as for why people don't protest Costco, I think I think there's part of, part of it is the is the red wine and smoked salmon thing, which Sam's Club is, is kind of catching up to. Um, I think another part of it is 
the, the, relevant, the relevant interest groups, say the uh, Union of Food and Commercial Workers of the SEIU, don't have nearly as much to gain from unionizing Costco, from unionizing Target, as they have to gain from unionizing Walmart. So, so one, on one hand, Walmart's revenues, if, if I remember correctly, Walmart's annual revenues are something like 170% of their next 13 largest competitors put together. Okay, so, so, Wal, so, yes, so Walmart, Walmart is huge by any definition of huge. Uh, two, since, what, you know, since Walmart, Walmart's, uh, Walmart's labor force is well over a million. 1.8. 1.8 million. Okay, thanks. I, I, I can never remember. It's, it, it, yeah, it keeps growing. It's 1.2, 1.4, 1.0. Okay. All right, 1. 1.8 million people. Somewhere between 44 to 70% turnover. Okay. 44 to 70% turnover. Wow. Okay. I, think, I think it's actually 44 overall, and it's 70% in the first year. Okay. The first year employees are in a very highly, but then after that. Okay. Okay, so, so, so let's, run, let's run with the 1.8 million number. So if you are, so if you're the UFCW or the SEIU, um, if you can unionize half that, so roughly a million people a year paying $20 a month in union dues, that's $240, $250 million a year in additional, you know, additional revenue for the SEIU, UFCW. So, um, if, 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 we take, if we take a public choice view of, uh, of sort of Walmart targeted rent seeking, we can, we can see how the incentives line up there. So. Whereas Costco, it's small potatoes relative to Walmart. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understood your point about suppliers sort of popping out. Mm. It's Walmart. And I'm thinking of the Snap and Roller carnival that's been online for right. years now, and your healthier your example is still a diet pet at this point. Uh, were you saying that still is making a mistake? No, that? no, 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 no. no. No, I think um, so. Okay, so, so so my my understanding of the Snapper lawnmower case was Snapper basically said, okay, look, we'll they they they, they effectively got themselves hung up on Walmart being sort of their their the, the gorilla in the room in terms of their portfolio of, of uh, companies with, with which they do business, and since well, and, and since 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 Snapper didn't have a comparative advantage in producing cheap lawnmowers for Walmart, eventually they got. All, for all intents and purposes, run out of business um, because one really cheap lawnmower is a pretty good substitute for another. In the still case, I think I think, I think what, what what they're doing, and, and I think where where people are going to go with a lot of this is someone who needs who actually needs a really good chainsaw, for example, would pro- will probably want to go to someone will probably want to go to a store that knows something about hardware, and still still also also has much more brand equity than say you know Arch chainsaws. Or something like that. Um, so, so since, since what still is selling is not just a chainsaw, but also a very high quality chainsaw, and sort of a network of support people who can help you out of the chain, uh, who can help you find the exact chainsaw to fit your needs, then they're, I, I think they're probably making a very good decision by choosing only to deal with non-big box outlets. Um, conversely, you know, I just yeah, I needed a chainsaw just to cut up some branches. In you know in our yard, it's, so it wasn't it was fun, but it wasn't like we needed a really like a major heavy duty chainsaw. So we go down to we went down to Lowe's and bought one for 50, 50 or sixty bucks, and it does what we needed to do. So so I think so I think sort of the beauty of it all is there's room for everybody. Like people who people who need a really good chainsaw can go to um, mom and pop's chainsaw depot and get a high quality steel chainsaw. People like me who just need to cut up some branches in the yard can go down to Lowe's. Where you know the people, you know the guy, where, where the guy who the guy who told me where the chainsaws are just quit his job at McDonald's last week and doesn't know anything about it, doesn't really know much about the mechanics of chainsaws, and I can get something to do the yard work that I need to do. So 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 long and short long and, so short answer to your question, no, I don't think Still's making a mistake. Okay. Okay. Yeah, follow up. Well, not necessarily follow up. Okay. Um, the data, I, I, people are looking into it. I, I don't know what the data say. Um, my back of the envelope um, anecdotal experience with that is is the the old Walmart in Gardendale. 
um, that is down the road from the new Super Walmart is now a Hobby Lobby. So, 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 the, so there are, so there are, there are firms that can come in. Um, what, what would be interesting to see would be what, what are, what are the zoning restrictions that prevent Walmart from turning over this property rapidly? Does it have to be a big box store, or does it have to be something that would do that, or can you? Divide a, can you create like a, sort of like a little shopping center inside the old Walmart? And that I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, I understand that a lot of, I know in Memphis there are a lot of, uh, and by a lot I mean I know of one, uh, maybe two, um, sort of like large churches that have either bought or leased space where large retailers used to be. So that so there's a there's a big church near uh, near the church that we go to um, that is in, I don't know if it used to be a Walmart or a Target or what, but it was it was, it was at one point a big box store. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Actually, James Howard Kunstler has a uh, is, is is an interesting architectural and social critic who has uh, if you Google him he has he has the architectural eyesore of the month on his website which is actually kind of cute and then the uh, uh, James Howard Kunstler I think it's K U N S T L E R. Um, Geography of no, no yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but he, 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 he argues that eventually shopping malls will be will be redeveloped and, and turned into something a little bit more compact. So we can do the we, I mean, we can do the same with old WalMarts and Targets and whatnot as well. 